Hey everybody, today is June 28th and this is the KCP community meeting. I've got the agenda up on the screen. I am pasting a link to issue 1385, which is this one. If you would like to add anything to the agenda, please do so with a comment. And uh, we always go through incoming issues and milestone epics at the end. So Stefan, I will turn it over to you for your first comment here. Yeah, if you can click on the first thing. So there are two big PRs, and I just want to mention some changes because if you notice issues in new tests or in old tests, um, this is relevant. So the first one, there is a new end-to-end -end test called end-to-end-sharded. -end Sharding is a big word here. It's one shard at the moment. Uh, we will get more, of course, eventually, but at the moment, the main changes as a front proxy, our front proxy in front. Um, this is consequences on what you can do. The front proxy, it routes requests to, to workspaces. So it knows on which shard, there's only one at the moment, but it, it knows on which shard the workspace lives and routes normal traffic to the shard. That's the first thing. You will not notice any, any difference, so this is not relevant. Wildcard requests, though, don't exist. They just don't exist as a front proxy. If you want to do a wildcard request, you either need a virtual workspace or you have to go directly to a shard. So in, in, in a couple of end-to-end -end tests, we do wildcard requests for reasons, obviously. And um, if you can go back, Andy, the second link of the first item, at such a place. So next time a wildcard uh, request fails, uh, I think you have to wait until it has exploded and it's quite cool. Right it later. Um, okay, got it. <laughs> there it is. So I added those three lines in a couple of places. Basically, the normal KCP or Cube cluster client is against the front proxy. If you want to do wildcard uh, requests or anything which is not possible to uh, the front proxy, you have to, to change your config. Like this is a root config, so that's a, a helper shard config. So you give it um, a KCP client, so it can get the shard object. You tell which shard you want, so it's root in this case, and you give it a, a REST config, and you get back a configuration which works for clients against the shard directly. And I usually call them root shard KCP client, something like that. So as before, but with this root prefix. And this you can just use and do whatever you like uh, as before, uh, starting formats, wildcard formats, for example, or whatever you like. That's the first big change. Otherwise, I think nothing should change. Something more is coming. Sergius is working on removing system master from the normal admin user. So if you get an admin cube config from the, proxy, from the front proxy, it will be cluster admin, but it won't be system master. It hasn't worked yet, but it will. And um, the difference is system masters skips authorization, which means from that point on, when we change it, all requests, including the, the admin ones, will go through authorization. And some admission as well. We have some exceptions in admission um, where we check for system master. Uh, this is, I mean, you have to, to see what you want. Like virtual workspaces, for example, they connect directly to shards. They can still have and will have system master but the end-to-end -end tests won't. Same thing, if you want system master, you have to do some magic to, to get it. All right, that's the first big change. It can go back. So the second is coming, it's green, so just waiting for a last review maybe. Oh, I, um, I looked, it wasn't. Okay, I see it is now. And this is something we wanted to do for a long time. Um, we have system CRDs at the moment, so they, they live in some system CRD workspace, a shadow workspace, and are just virtually mapped into workspaces. That's the current state. When this merges, everything but the, the API export binding and schema will be also API bindings. Um, this has usability or feature consequences. We can open up organization workspaces and also the future home workspaces to users. Like users can be administrator in an, in an org, for example. And we have ways to control what they can do on cluster workspaces, for example. 
So it's cool to get that. Again, it has consequences. API bindings, API exports, they have identity. Usually this is not very visible, but um, here you have to know. So identity is a, is a, it's a secret next to the API export. And we reflect the, the secret content. This, I mean, the, it's a random string. Well, it's not random, it's an us a key, I think, Andy, you know better. Um, yeah, some, I think some, I, I, think I some did binary, a key. Some binary blob, whatever it is uh, in detail. We do a hash out of that and store the hash in the API export and also in, in the API binding. If you access a workspace with those objects, you don't have to know that. Like you, you go to the API endpoint for cluster workspaces, for example, and you just get the cluster workspaces. But again, the wildcards are special. When you want to do a wildcard request on an API binding, on a resource from an API binding, you have to pass the identity hash string. So concretely, the resource is not cluster workspaces anymore. It's cluster workspaces, colon, and then this hash. So I know 64 character uh, string or something like that. But that's only if you're doing a wildcard. It's just for wildcard, exactly. But we do wildcards. So a virtual workspace, for example, does wildcard inform us. And <laughs> if you go back to the... But those are the hidden for you. Yeah, it's not hidden in end-to-end, -end, that's why. <laughs> OK, got it. <laughs> so it's hidden if you are just third-party developer. That's true. But we are not, so we have to know. Yeah. So what? Um, in the in the in the workspaces, virtual workspace, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It's it's mostly hidden when so so what I'm talking about here is usually done either directly in end-to-end -end tests because it's low level, or it's done in the main go of the binary. So KCP go in CMD KCP, for example, calls this function. Um it's a function which I mean you, you see what it does. So it gets a number of exports. Um no, I think it's the wrong link. One second. Can you go to on the left side in the in the tree to bootstrap? Which one? Helpers uh, bootstrap. Package package. No, no, sorry. Package bootstrap is it? It's a new package. Package server bootstrap. That's that's okay. the one. Uh, server that one identity. And the function, the big one that is new contract something. That one exactly. So this is called basically um, at the root of virtual workspaces and also at the root of our server. Um, you give it a, a config, you give it a couple of mappings from group to export names. And for some exceptions, we have also for group resource to export names. And you give it a client and it will basically loop for, it doesn't loop it. it it wants to read the API export, which are derived from those um, from those uh, mappings here. And it will return an identity config, so a config, a REST config, which has injected the identity strings via uh, um, a round trip wrapper. So it calls config.wrap, and there's a round tripper you can add to it, you can modify the round tripper, and it injects those identity string. So you don't have to care about that. So everything which you see here, um, it's implementation, you don't have to care. What you have to care, maybe you search for a new config with wildcard where it's used and you see an example. Maybe the one from the front proxy. Yeah, that's one, exactly. So what it does, this is very early in the main go. Um, it's called, you give some default mappings, which are the mappings for our root workspace API export. So there are new API exports for all our uh, APIs. And it will return a config, which has this wrapping magic inside. And it gives you this resolve identities. It's a function, which basically must be called uh, infinitely until it succeeds. So that you see this poll immediately infinite with context. It just calls resolve identities until error is nil. From that on, the config is valid. And you can use the config to instantiate and start inform us. 
you might ask why it's done like that, that the, the solve function is external here and the config is returned early. You get the config, you can create clients, you can create informers, but don't start informers and don't try to use the resources in the config or in the client which need an identity. It will just not work. So it's a config you can use, but it's not functional yet for those identity resources. Why we need that, the plumbing in KCP itself and the server is like that, that we have to call the resolve identities from a post start hook. I will try to spend some time looking at this today, Stefan. Okay, um, any questions, comments on any of that? I know it's a lot but it's, it's very cool to see it coming. All right, um, Steve, over to you, 1149. Cool. Um, yeah, so this, another th thing that hopefully doesn't uh, <laughs> irritate anybody by changing things from out under the hood. Um, so in the last week, we've had a flurry of activity here uh, cluster workspace types have allowed parents, allowed children. We have initializers per type. Um, we're soon going to get rid of the hard-coded bootstrapping thing coming in. And there is, there's two uh, open PRs. Uh, one is doing type inheritance. Um, if you have opinions on what that looks like, how it feels, please put your comments in there. The second one is a, an example uh, initializer as a service, which there's this, the, the bootstrapping for that and the test there kind of show off what it would look like for a user to create their own API, install it and export it, run their controller, have people bind to it. So it looks a lot like what um, it'll be. Uh, if you go up somewhere, there's a bootstrap.go in package reconciler somewhere, Andy, at the top. It's a bootstrap file? Yes. Which one of these? Uh, the bottom one? <laughs> Might want to clean that up. They're all, you know. Yeah. There's context. Um, sorry, it was the top one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. So, like, you know, here where I, ha you know, I'm I'm some sort of author. I've got a Go definition for my types. I've generated a CRD from it. I have clients for it, et cetera. So here I'm taking that custom resource definition. I'm creating a resource schema. I'm creating a an export from that. I'm waiting for the export to be you know synced and have a virtual workspace available for me. Um, I think if you keep scrolling down, I yeah. So here the API export virtual workspace URLs are ready, then because this is like a little bit self-referential here, I'm also creating a binding. I'm waiting for it to be bound. I'm using the virtual workspace to access the thing and create objects in there. So this is kind of you know very much what I think a lot of system providers are going to be doing on our on our system. So I think would be, some diagrams could help, maybe, just to illustrate the flow here. For, for what this is doing. I mean, this is using our API binding code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not adding any new concepts here. I'm just like using them together, um, right? Like this is the whole process of like create a type, export it, use the virtual workspace to do something, run a controller off of it. Um, I, yeah, okay, I think so. so the, the custom resource definition, what is, tell me what that is. It, like, 
is this I'm a system I'm I'm some sort of system provider of, of some API. This is a CRD that's been generated from the Go type for my API. And is it installed? Like, where does it live? Is it YAML? Is it in etcd? Uh, so, yeah, and this is a good question, right? Like, I'm not really sure what we're expecting everyone to be doing, but I wrote uh, an API in Go. I ran whatever generator to create a CRD YAML, which sits in this folder, and then here, the first thing I do is convert it into a resource schema and then create an API export from it. Perhaps our generators could help with that. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'll follow up with you offline. Um, but yeah, if you have, if you have, you know, if anyone here has opinions on the user flow of being an API provider, this is worth worth a look. So yeah, the big things there are, you know. More fully featured types and inheritance, and then, you know, kind of using all of it together to actually implement that. And it's thirteen seventy five is the inheritance form. Yep. And it's only you know the, together it's only like six thousand lines of new code. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anybody have any questions or comments on that? Okay. Um, any. Nothing new in here. Oh, Robin, go for it. So are we implying here that if you are supplying an API that you would have a one of these cluster workspace types? I think I missed kind of the intro to what the type is for. Steve, you want to take it, that? It, yeah, so I think it totally depends, right? Like, um, if you're providing a type, you're going to have that export. Or sorry, if you're providing an API, you'll have that export. If you'd like to also provide some sort of default cluster workspace environment that uses it, that would be where you have an initializer that'll you know bind to it, maybe create a default version of it or something. Um, okay, so if you want to do initialization, then you would have one of these types. Yes. So the way that we factored it right now is there is one initializer per type that is opt-in. Okay. So the different types, like, you know, you could create a type that says this is this is a, a pipeline workspace and the initializer installs Tecton. Or you could say this is a you know team workspace and instead of having its own initializer, it inherits from the pipelines and maybe some sort of auth or like whatever other things. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And I uh, next week or like whenever this is finished, there will be a much more uh, polished demo. OK. Uh, any other topics for today? Questions? That's kind of just an open discussion forum if anybody's got anything. If not, I will move on to incoming untriaged issues and uh, check in on the milestone. OK, let's move on to issues. Uh, so we'll take a look at the 14 here that don't have a milestone set. And uh, what we're trying to do is not go deep into anything that's in here, but um, just make sure we understand what it is, what the priority uh, generally looks like, and whether it's, at this point, whether it's so critical, we're going to put it in 0 0.7. Uh, which will be our next milestone after we close out 0 0.6, or we'll put it in TBD, indicating it's important and we want to um, prioritize it later when we do milestone planning for 0 0.7 and beyond, or we could leave the milestone blank if we need additional um, feedback or commentary. This one I had seen before, it seemed to be a question, uh, having some issues, and uh, I've, I've seen a few coming from Bianca 2-BE without much reply. So uh, I am happy to put this in TBD and just say um, it's on your end. All right, next up, um, one that I filed about doing some proud work for post submits. Um, this is 
can be done asynchronously whenever folks have time. Uh, I would do it, except I'm having container engine issues. Um, so if anybody's interested in helping out with getting additional CI set up and would like some pointers, happy to send you that way uh, or send them your way. Would love to see folks help out here if possible. Um, here's an issue about a, a placement label not being removed when an API binding is deleted. Um, Stefan or Joaquim or David, any thoughts on the, should we just do this TBD and revisit when TBD. we do zero time planning? Yeah, we understand the issue. We, okay. I have a prototype, we missed something to complete it. Got it, thanks. Uh, this is, oh, this was the, um, uh, the API export empty, empty API export with a permission claim, right, Stefan? Or was this, oh no, this is multiple compute workspaces. Oh, I think this is definitely is TBD. We'll revisit all the TBDs when we do 07 planning. This was the one that um, was the uh, empty API export with claims and then documentation. So um, also TBD for future API export work. OK, this one I know there's some back and forth on around what is our minimum Kubernetes version we support, and if we should be doing token uh, requests or whatnot. Um, I'm also going to put this in TBD. Yeah, I, I tried that. There's a workaround. You have to uh, pre-create a secret or something. Yeah. I didn't get it to work, um, but it's help wanted. So if somebody likes deployments and knows about secrets in 125, 24. Um, I mean, I, I've, I have created a secret with the annotation and gotten the token generated. Um, okay. So I, I know that works. Um, so I think um, for Joachim and Sergius, if, uh, and anybody else who's interested, let's just continue to um, have the discussion on the issue and then come up with a plan that we all agree with. Uh, all right, this one, I suggest we close this. So David, maybe we have a discussion here. Um, so you had filed this saying that if, if somebody is accessing a resource that comes via a permission claim, that that needs to be done with impersonation. Yeah, that that's something that we met uh, during when discussing uh, with Stefan, and also you know, based on on um, questions from from Matthews about um, the, the problem is if we don't do yeah. that, this is an escalation escalation of permissions. The user can only accept something that he is able to do, which means we have to restrict it. If the service provider of the other API, like the one which is claimed here, um, restricts permissions for reasons, then the second pro uh, the second API provider, which just has a claim with empty resources, he shouldn't escalate. He shouldn't override the first provider. But I think it's correct. Okay, I it's think correct a, to a more fleshed out example would be helpful, where yes. we have. Uh, two different uh, pro API providers indicate who the user is or users, what controller service accounts are in play. So um, let's 
either David or Stefan, if, if y'all can flesh this out so that it's um, more thorough, then I, I think that'll be helpful. Yeah. Today. I'm going to put this in seven since this is related to the work that Sean's doing for yeah. permission claims. Okay. Uh, define proper controller author behavior for connection URLs. This has to do with sharding. Yeah, there's a big topic around that. I'm not sure this one is a special question. Steve, is he here? Yeah. Yes. Oh, so, sorry, I need to read this to page it back in. <laughs> oh, yeah, I think uh, basically it was like, Is this how to deal with two informers for the same resource? Yeah, yeah. It it was what is the replication claim equivalent for a virtual workspace? Yeah, what are the URLs? Are they one to one with the shards? These because like in in the normal KCP access case, we have one front proxy, and we have a client for that, and then we have the shard local cached stuff from replicated claims. Right now, for virtual workspaces, we have a URL per shard. We don't have a proxy in front of them. And so those controllers would have to have, what, N clients? I, I, I think not N. I mean, the goal is to have something smaller than N. But um, I think this is an epic we have to talk about for next sprint, for next yeah. prototype. So I put it in TBD and labeled it for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh yeah, I, I think I I know Robin had stumbled across this. Thanks for filing. I think I ran into it at some point, but wasn't sure if it was just something I was doing wrong. So um, I'm going to this is authorization. I'm gonna oh, should I sign this to Sergius? Or yeah, please, please. It's an escalation topic. We know there's an escalation check in Cube. We haven't looked deep into it. All right, I don't know why I can't. S, S minus B, I think. Uh, S minus U. Thank you. This is the one. Yes. OK. TV. Um, this is me working on dynamic discovery. I'm going to put this in. Seven. Um, yeah, I've run into lots of times where workspaces get stuck in an infinite loop trying to get deleted because the finalizer is not. I think there all of all of those are basically the other issue we had before about deleted API bindings and deleted workload clusters. With my PR, which removes those, like the finalizers when the local cluster is gone, you have just default after running end to end. Um, what about, like, I, this is probably a, a topic for a longer discussion, but what about when somebody, um, I, I guess if you try to delete a workspace, but you haven't deleted anything else, the, the deleter will get rid of the workload cluster and then you're, PR will kick in and get rid of the yes. finalizers. Is that right? Yes. OK. All right, well, um, so I'm going to just assign this to you. Yes. And what's the status on? I know it's WIP. Um, yeah, we don't have all information, so we don't have the cluster name, I think. I talked with you after and we have to see how to move forward. OK, so do you want TBD or 07? 07. 
Uh, oh, controllers. I know this is. Oh, and so there was a question about whether or not we could use controller runtime. I do think we can use it in KCP. We just can't use it in our Kubernetes fork. Because the reason you can't use it in the Kubernetes fork is because of the dependency issues. But in KCP, like, yeah, maybe, maybe. So it's it's worth trying. Like maybe we can take one small controller and see if we can convert it or something. Yeah, and I I think we are at a point where we could talk about levels. Like we have core controllers, low level, and we have things like TMC, which is much higher level and could use it. Okay. And there's also, I think, the low level should not be an excuse to do things like encode many different types of keys into different strings in one queue and then. Oh, yeah, we, we don't. <laughs> right, like the other other nice property of controller runtime is it, it just forces you to be a little bit more diligent about that sort of stuff because it's not possible otherwise. Okay. Um, some authorizer not implemented. TBD. Um, TBD. We... Yes, but I would like to see a fix. <laughs> yeah, if if we are mainly speaking of of the virtual workspace, of the workspaces, virtual workspace. It's mostly, I mean, after the cleaning that I've been doing in, in the context of the homework spaces to fix a number of obsolete uh, behavior, that should make it much more, you know, easy to, to pull up uh, the various subject success reviews, which are done inside the virtual workspace code yeah. uh, up to, to the, 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 the authorizer because it's you know much more consistent with the rest of the of the KCP authorizers now. So this is basically move the SARS inside the yeah. spaces yeah. virtual yeah. workspace code and make them an authorizer. Yes, exactly. But but there are still light steps to to do mainly completely get rid of you know the being a member of the top level orgs which still relates to the previous way of doing things where we were creating workspaces in top level orgs so we have to completely get rid of this option and then we would be really compatible with uh, the rest of how airbag is, is managed and would okay if, would if you have like a series of steps that could be split out into separate work items. Feel free to update the description here and add tasks for them or add separate issues for well, them. Well, the, the other tasks I'm speaking of are, by in any case, required for the homework spaces uh, okay. epic. So I think if we keep this one in TBD, um, it will I'm come naturally after, after the Name on it for now. Yeah, if you want. All right, last one here. No info on the version of the plugin. Uh, let's do help. TV. Okay, that's all the incoming. These are the a new set of issues. These are the milestone blockers for zero six. So. I'm going to start at the bottom. This this one is placement, essentially, right? Or is this location yeah. workspaces, too? Oh, it's placement. OK, so I know we have a PR for it. Um, I have not had time to review it. If folks are looking for uh, helping out with reviews, there is a placement. Uh, so it's this 1277. Um, multi workspace controller development. So we're 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 close. We have a way to um, wrap 
the REST config for existing generated clients so that you don't have to regenerate anything. And it will largely just work with minimal issues. Um, we have listers that are a lister generator and we're wrapping up an informer generator and controller runtime. Uh, we have a fork of it. It does not require any replace directives to KCP Kubernetes. So uh, you can just put one replace directive in that says use KCP's controller runtime and things will just work. And the example has been updated. There's um, some additional stuff I know that Matush has been working on to try and make it so that you can take your code base and point it at Kubernetes or OpenShift or KCP and have it just work without you having to do any extra work. Um, I think we're probably going to tweak that a little bit, but it's definitely um, better than having to maintain two different code bases. So that's that one. Um, I don't know that we necessarily will hold 0 0.6 for this stuff to finish uh, if it comes shortly after. I think that's fine. Next up is quota. So I have it mostly working per workspace for namespace scoped things. There's no aggregation, uh, which we talked or roll up. Uh, we'll do that later. And there's no support for cluster scoped resources yet. The There have been some weird issues where if I run a test, say, seven times in a row, it works the first six, but fails consistently on the seventh. And it seems to have, it has something to do with a shared informer and watch events and not seeing them all for some reason. So um, I'm continuing to look into that. Um, I don't have an ETA for when I feel comfortable that the tests don't have flakes in them or that the there are not bugs. So um, just continuing to do that. David, over to you for user home workspaces. How are things going there? Uh, things are we are well going quite well. Um, spent you know you know quite some time last week uh, in uh, thinking about um, how we manage permissions and the um, right to automatically create the, the home workspace um, and especially the um, various interactions with possibly external services that would need to create workspaces inside this home workspace. Um, yeah, it seems we, we, we arrived to something that, that is, you know, consistent and, and, and fits with all the, the use cases, as far as I can say. Um, now I'm mainly cleaning the peers. There was, uh, in, in the, in the course of the whole, you know, uh, proof of, of concept of, of the homework spaces, there was a number of things to, to change and clean up in the, uh, virtual workspace, uh, workspaces, virtual workspace, which was quite obsolete in terms of permissions, typically using the, the member uh, role, which is, you know, um, just something which is top level and should disappear in the future, uh, related to the fact that we created workspaces in top level orgs. And this was mainly used at all levels. So, I mean, permissions were just used, uh, not, not up to date anymore. Uh, so I had to fix, to fix this as well. And so I'm, I'm also you know, taking some time to clean up all these fix and, and create distinct peers for every every change in fact uh, which takes quite quite some time but you know the the, the main you know oh, i mean it works mainly but but then uh, these cleanups took a bit longer than than expected okay um That's what been... if you had to just give a rough guess like when do you think this is going to be ready for final review yeah, I, I was hoping this week, and I'm still hoping this week. I mean, okay, thanks. Uh, so I'm going to skip over the next one because we talked about it already. Sean, uh, I think you're here. How are things going with the um, permission claims? Uh, assuming that we are not removing the dynamic discovery. Yeah, we're okay. we're not. I I, okay. was, I had a brain fart yesterday. Okay. I was like, oh, we had so many discussions about this. <laughs> uh, it's all good. Um, okay. So if that's the case, then uh, 
I think I have all the fixes for Stefan's latest round of reviews uh, in my local branch, just push them up. And I think I fixed the tests, but one just failed, but it's like completely irrelevant to my stuff, I think. So got to dig into that. And then I'm working on Steve's round of reviews now. So hopefully we can get this in soon, but um, yeah. Okay, can you, um, when you have a second, just Slack me the, the test failure. I just want to look at it. Yep. Thanks. Um, Stefan, any any additional updates on sharding beyond what you talked about? The... Yeah, I just said the informal work will slip, I guess. Okay. So we will get the, uh, the watch cache, I hope. So that the PR Lucas open today will merge. It's enabled again, but. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I know Mike's not here, so I think I haven't seen any. Um, I haven't seen anything related to this, so I have a feeling this is probably not in scope for zero point six. Okay. Uh, any final topics before we call it a meeting? Okay. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Bye. See you.